out those 12 boys plus their soccer coach from that flooded cave that they've been stuck inside for the last 16 days. Already, ABC News can report and confirm that four of those 16 boys are out of the cave and have been taken to the hospital. There's a lot of activity. It's a fluid situation. You're taking a look at some of the video. I believe this is video outside the hospital. You can see the different emergency vehicles that are heading towards the hospital. Our reporters on the ground in Thailand have been telling us that a number of ambulances have been leaving the cave site and then heading towards the hospital. So we're getting it's sort of a drip drip of information as all of this is playing out right now. But incredibly, again, that rescue mission underway, we can confirm four of the boys are out of the cave. And this is great news considering the plan was to try to get the most, uh, the, the, what they considered the weakest or sickest of the boys out of the cave system first and get them to the hospital. So the fact that they have been able to extract four boys successfully is great news for the rest of the group. Again, an unfolding situation, developing story. We're going to bring in a number of correspondents and experts uh, throughout our continuing coverage here. First, let's go to Eva Pilgrim, live in London, who's been following all the developments out of Thailand. And uh, Eva, just walk us through some of the bullet points, some of the latest details that we know right now. Well, we have confirmed that four of those boys have been brought out, and they're now saying that they're healthy. The plan at this point is to try to get the other boys out in the next 10 to 20 hours. That is what we're told. But you mentioned that they've gotten four out. Those were the weakest of the four boys in the group, and they did it in relatively quick time. Initially, they told us that these trips would take upwards of 10 hours, five hours in, five hours out. This happened pretty quickly. Now, this is the problem process that they're going through. They're taking them out two at a time in a buddy system and putting a diver in front of them and a diver behind them just to keep them safe and to make sure that the boys don't panic. They don't want to take the whole group out at the same time in case one of the boys does get frightened, does panic. It's a much more controllable situation when you have just two of them. It's much easier to keep them calm. And, and they're taking them past the difficult area inside the cave, one of the most difficult areas, and then they're restaging there as they move to the entrance of the cave to actually get them out. Now, once the boys get out of the cave, they are then taken to basically a triage tent where they're checked out. They decide to look at them and see how they're doing health-wise before they put them in that ambulance and then get them to the hospital. Now, we know some of the issues that they were facing as they were trying to determine now for days how they were going to get these boys out was one if it was even safe to move them, would these boys be strong enough to make that journey? That was one of the major concerns. But they were up against this rush of time because, one, the oxygen in the cave has been at varying levels, and that has been very concerning. One of the Thai Navy SEAL divers dying uh, in the cave earlier this week because of those oxygen levels, and, and that was a, a big concern with how they would move those boys. Would those boys be strong enough to make the journey? But also, this is the beginning of Mon monsoon season in Thailand. If the rain starts, that water starts to rise again in the cave, it becomes much more difficult for these boys to get out. And a lot of these areas in the cave are very small, hard to navigate, even for these experienced Navy SEAL divers. And they didn't want to put those boys in a dangerous situation if they didn't have to. At this point, the water is pretty down, so it's an easier journey, they're saying, for the boys than it would have been if the water was higher up. And I think that is in big part why we're seeing these journeys in and out go much more quickly with. And Eva, uh, bear with me here a second. I just want to point out to our viewers what you're seeing on your screen there. We were showing a graphic repeatedly of, of what that cave system looked like, where you had these different chambers that would open up an open air place, but then other parts you can see were completely submerged underwater. We were getting word that uh, crews were going inside that cave system. They were actually using underwater jackhammers to try to clear out the ceiling, basically break free some more pockets so that the boys didn't have to be underwater for as long of a period of time. Because we were getting word that some of these boys didn't even know how to swim. And the ones who did certainly weren't skilled enough to be able to go underwater for long periods of time. So when you consider the Navy SEAL Eva, who you mentioned, who, who died as part of this rescue effort, this really gives you a sense of just what these boys were facing. The fact that a trained expert even had trouble 
underwater there and now you have to take a, a group of 12 boys plus a soccer coach and try to get them out of there but Eva you were saying that they felt like they had no more time left with the impending rains coming through right the impending rain that is supposed to be coming there. Our crews on the ground, uh, Adrian was talking earlier today about the fact that it's raining where she is right now. And, and it doesn't take a whole lot of rain to see that flooding go up. You have to remember when these boys initially went in, they were able to walk in the entrance of the cave. And in no time at all, the rain came pouring down and they were trapped. Now, the cave itself just to kind of explain to people how these boys were navigating inside. It's a it's a series of tunnels that stretches for miles and miles, and it really is a remarkable story, a miracle that these boys were able in that, uh, the flooding that was happening in those caves to find a dry spot and to put themselves together in this dry spot and survive and wait for nine days for someone to come find them. That video of the British divers finding them and talking to them uh, and, and seeing them somewhat healthy, I mean, weak, but healthy there sitting together uh, was so remarkable and so incredible to see. And, and so many people just, it, it was hard to have hope after nine days that they would be okay and to see that they are okay. And now the four weakest of those boys out and to hear that they're healthy, just a remarkable situation. Absolutely. Eva, we're showing that video right now. Um, I mean, this is a, an inherently emotional human story. I and mean, we saw for nine days, you mentioned the parents of those boys praying outside the opening of that cave. Um, when others around the world had lost hope, they believed that perhaps those boys were still alive. And then to see those images, the video of their smiling faces, there they are right there. I mean, just uh, incredible. And you, one can only imagine the agony. I'm a parent myself, what it must have been like for those parents to wait, not knowing the outcome. And then today, an emotional roller coaster. Of course, everybody excited about the fact that they're, this rescue effort is underway and they're bringing the boys out, but still the challenges that lie ahead for many of them and also the medical treatment and just the re-entry into the world. They've been underground. They haven't seen sunlight for 16 days. They haven't had proper meals. So this, there's still a long road ahead, but certainly a, a hopeful story as we're watching all of these developments unfold. Eva Pilgrim, stay with us for a moment. We're going to come back to you in just a second. But first, though, I do want to bring in John Cohen on the phone for us, a former acting undersecretary for the Department of Homeland Security. And, John, we know this is a, an international effort. The U.S. is heavily involved, uh, the British, Australia, um, many teams from around the world. Uh, tell us what's going on here and how a rescue mission like this is coordinated with all of these different nations involved. Right. It, it, it's very complicated, as you pointed out. I mean, you have to work out uh, how you provide for a unified command and control. And that that exists within every phase of this rescue, whether it's the search and locate, whether it's the development of the rescue plan itself, whether it's preparing to conduct the rescue and, and, and the pre-positioning pre of equipment along the way uh, that the rescuers will follow. It's the transportation of these kids to an uh, initial triage site where they can be evaluated immediately by medical personnel uh, and then transporting them to the hospital. And then after their immediate care, it's going to be the long-term care for these kids uh, for medical and mental health. At every stage, you have a multinational group that is working together to do this. And that raises a whole series of challenges, whether it's uh, language issues, uh, equipment, communication equipment issues, uh, whether people have the same level of training or, or expertise. Uh, so as they are working to plan and execute a very, very complicated and challenging uh, rescue operation, they're having to deal with a number of logistic issues just simply because you have people from all over the country, uh, government and non-government personnel who, who are there to help. And we should point out to Thailand now, uh, this area specifically is 11 hours ahead of us. So it's now entering, uh, you know, past 9 p.m. local time there. They've been at this all day. Talk to me a little bit more about the buildup, John, and the decision that goes into saying, yes, let's do it. Because there are a variety of different ideas, one being that they would cable some kind of oxygen line into the cave system and somehow be able to provide oxygen, and then they could bring the boys out that way. There were also ideas about drilling different boreholes into the cave system and maybe they could climb out. So there are all these different ideas. And then they were moving forward on this buddy system 
And then you get the news of the Navy SEAL who died. And that was really a shock on the entire system where everybody was realizing just how treacherous this journey would be for these boys. What goes into the decision to say, yes, we're going to do it, and today is the day? Well, there's a number of factors. Uh, and I, I just have to say, I mean, I've been involved in law enforcement, homeland security, emergency management for over 32 years. And as I was thinking about this and watching all the coverage, I was you know, thinking to myself how complicated of a, of a rescue operation uh, and, and emergency management operation this, very is, this is. And I don't think that should be lost on anybody who, who's watching this. So factors that the planners are uh, going to be looking at. Uh, one, are they ready? Do they have a viable plan that the experts on scene believe will work? Because as you pointed out, they were exploring a number of different options. But at some point, uh, there was a, a collective recommendation made to those who were in charge of this operation uh, w in which the uh, the military and other rescue uh, uh, experts said, this is what we think is the most viable option. Uh, the second factor they're going to be looking at is the, the conditions inside the cave and the health of, of the kid. Um, you know, how much longer can they wait? How much longer can those kids survive in the conditions in which they're, they're living in? And then they're going to look at the conditions uh, along the rescue route. Uh, do they expect that they can improve those conditions and make the rescue easier? Or are there other factors such as the weather uh, and uh, the oxygen uh, uh, the, the oxygen purity uh, that's going to make uh, the rescue attempt more complicated? They're going to be tracking the, the weather in the area, just like Eva was talking about. And if they're concerned that the uh, weather conditions are going to get worse and make rescue operations um, that much uh, more difficult, th that's going to feed into their decision. And finally, they're going to look at the condition of the rescuers. Um, at a certain point, there's only, a, you know, there's only a limited number of people who have the expertise and the, the training and the ability to conduct these types of operations. And at a certain point, you're going to run the risk that those rescuers are going to become uh, exhausted. Uh, and so th that's another thing that a command, uh, the person in command of this operation is going to be factoring into their decision making. All right, John Cohen, uh, former acting undersecretary, Department of Homeland Security. Stay with us uh, with our continuing coverage. Thank you so much for your insight. I just want to update our viewers here. Uh, we are confirming once again that four boys are out of the cave. Four of those 12 boys on the wild boar soccer team and the coach being the 13th person down there. Four boys are out of the cave, and we're also getting word uh, from a press conference that was underway that they are healthy. Uh, again, that from officials in Thailand, that the four boys out of the cave are healthy and that uh, our understanding is they were transported to a local hospital. Um, I do want to bring in uh, Admiral Robert Harward, a former Navy SEAL, deputy of a U.S. Central Command and an ABC News uh, contributor. Uh, Admiral Harward, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, your insight critical here because uh, you yourself, being a former Navy SEAL, talk to us about the conditions that these boys and their rescuers are up against today. Well, it's a tough, uh, not only the water, the confined environments, uh, everything that goes with that makes it challenging. And any time you're underwater, especially um, you take on a degree of, uh, of danger uh, and all the physical and mental issues that come from that. So add to that in this very restricted environment makes it challenging for even those most experienced divers. Uh, much less the kids. The good news is now that they've had the time, they've set all the mechanisms in, in place, lines that you can follow, air, either surface plate or bottles that have moved in place, and then the expertise that's in place to assist with all this. But I think John uh, hit exactly right. All of that has a shelf life. So as they deal with this, uh, the risk of additional rains, raising the water level, you also deal with the risk of people now operating around the clock for weeks on end and the toll it takes on them, which increases the danger to all. So they've got to balance all of those elements to get the rest of the kids out. So we've been successful. We've gotten a third of them out. We've learned the lessons. Let's rest everyone, be prepared, and then the surge to get the last group out. Admiral, talk to me about what this means, the fact that a former Thai Navy SEAL died in the buildup to all of this. Uh, that really, you know, we, we've discussed it in our reporting, really sent a shockwave through the camp there on the ground as, as they were assessing whether or not they could even train these boys um, properly 
to get out of there safely. How hard is it to teach a completely inexperienced child, really, to be able to breathe underwater with this special equipment and climb through uh, these, these tunnels for hours and hours on end? Describe the challenges and how hard that is. Uh, we just lost uh, Admiral Harward. We're, we'll check back with him a little bit later. We've got a few people that we can check in with uh, during our coverage. We want to go out back to Thailand, though, and Adrian Bankert, uh, I believe, was uh, close to the hospital there where some of the uh, boys were being taken. If we can bring in Adrian this morning. Uh, Adrian, uh, I've been checking the emails here and watching your notes come through. Confirm now four boys uh, out of the hospital and said to be healthy today. What can you tell us? It is the greatest news we could expect. We're right outside the hospital, as you just said. Uh, if you look behind me, you can see this strip of green fabric wrapped around the entrance there. Uh, the police have moved all journalists to across the street and down the street uh, as far away as possible uh, with respect to the families who, of course, deserve every ounce of privacy. At the same time, the world has been watching this story. So many hoping and praying that these 13, 12 boys and their coach make it out of this cave safe and alive. Now we do know, as you said, four boys are confirmed out of the cave. They're all healthy, uh, but of the remaining children, we know that many of them will not likely get out of the cave until tomorrow. That's what we've been told by Thai officials. There was a press conference. Uh, they have said out of the four ambulances that we've actually seen with lights flashing and a police and military escort, there were four boys from that cave inside those four ambulances. We've been monitoring this. Matt Gutman and James Longman have been on this all week, actually uh, since the beginning for James. And we know that there is this series of triage. They start inside the cave in a staging area. Once there, they are checked out. Then they go to a field medic. They're checked out again, loaded into an ambulance. They are taken to a helicopter, flown into Chiang Rai. And then that helicopter uh, delivers them to another set of ambulances which is about one to two kilometers away from us, a seven minute ride, and they come here to the hospital to be reunited with their families. They've cleared an entire floor of this 14 story hospital in order to make sure that those kids are treated and then given back into the arms of their family and loved ones who are no doubt crying tears of joy tonight. Whit? Incredible, and Adrian, I, just uh, for our viewers, uh, forgive me, I said that they were out of the hospital. What I meant to say is they were out of the cave and then heading into the hospital. But uh, Adrian, you mentioned that we're still waiting I knew to what see. You meant. It's Got okay. it, of course. Yeah, just for clarity for our viewers out there. But you mentioned that their uh, officials are saying that it yes. might take until tomorrow for the rest of the team to come out or more boys to come out of the cave. Uh, I just want to note to our viewers as well that you're 11 hours ahead of us, so it's already nighttime there in Thailand. So we're, but we're still looking at a matter of hours here, right? Before the rest of the remaining eight boys on the team and the coach could be taken out of that cave, right? Right, it could be another 10 hours before we see another attempt at re rescue and recovery. Uh, those divers have to go in in pairs, remember. So with each person brought out, they have two divers alongside them. And, and the big part of the story is how dangerous it was for an experienced diver alone let alone a child who doesn't even know how to swim very well. So they are taking every precaution. They've been preparing for over a week to go in and do this safely. It has been a beautiful symphony of hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, along with rescue experts, and also those who are with the police and military from all over the globe who come together and been outside that cave and inside that cave uh, cheering on uh, this endeavor, which is undoubtedly one of the most amazing we've ever seen, at least amazing we've ever seen broadcast on live television like this. So many uh, people contacting us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter saying that they are ecstatic that these children are getting to come out safely. Uh, we had hoped that we would see at least one come out around 10 o'clock tonight local time. It is 9 o'clock tonight and we already have four out. So this is the epitome of under promise and over deliver and all of these rescuers just deserve a standing ovation for what they've done. Right? Ab absolutely and the entire world are rallying around these boys, the wild boar soccer team and of course all the rescuers doing incredible work. Adrian Banker, we will check back in with you soon. Any updates, please let us know and we'll break back in with you. I do want to bring in our Sam Champion who's joining me in the studio here. And Sam is able to help us out on two fronts here. You're a meteorologist, but also a diver as well. 
Talk to us about the conditions, uh, first with the weather, because one of the reasons why they expedited this rescue mission is the fact that a monsoon was coming in, which could further flood that cave. Right, so we're in monsoon season. There's basically two times that that happens in Thailand. It happens in the cold season and the warm season. So we're in one right now that generally starts around June and goes all the way through October. With, and we say it generally starts in June because it depends on when the moisture loads up and works in and when the final moisture works through the area. And just to give people the idea that in monsoon season, Season, during those short few months, we can pick up 50 inches of rain in that area. So in these rains that we're expecting to pop up in the afternoon today, tonight, tomorrow, we look at a couple of dry, drier days coming in the pattern. But every afternoon, these showers will really light up. And it can be more than showers. It can be several inches of rain. And to people at home, they're thinking, okay, four, five, six inches of rain doesn't sound like a lot of rain. That happens for us in Ohio, or it happens for us in Indiana, you know, during thunderstorms. But we're talking about a very mountainous area. And as you can see in those, in the chambers of the caves, that's basically the runoff for the water. So we're talking about, like, you know, in, in L.A., they have those big basins that they catch all the water and run in. And, and they're dry until it rains, and then there's 12 feet of water in them. Absolutely. So that's exactly what's going into these chambers in the caves. All that runoff water is going down through the mountains into these chambers, and those boys are right in one of them. It's, so It's important to remind our viewers, too, how they got in this situation. They walked into the cave. Exactly. And their water wasn't there. Maybe there were some muddy spots. But then that monsoon rain came through, and it flooded so quickly. Yep. cut off their exit. They had to retreat then deeper into the cave yeah. to find higher ground. So that's an idea of how fast things can change. Right. And it can change just like that, like you said. And, and we're talking about getting rain, more rain almost every afternoon until a big event moves through. And that's what they're most concerned about, getting these kids out of the caves before a big rain event moves through, something that's organized that can drop many, many, many inches of rain and last for several days. Let's talk about the diving part. You're, you're a diver yourself. I heard you on Good Morning America this morning talking about uh, the type of equipment that the boys were using. The rescuers were putting specialized masks on their faces. What can you tell me about that? Well, in the old days when we trained, and I trained to dive for GMA to do stories that were, that were underwater, and one of the things, there's just this human fear that you're holding a respirator, which is in the old days. It's, so it's, there's a mask with one strap, and then you're holding a piece in your mouth to get your air. Your nose is closed off from the mask, so you're only using your mouth to inhale and exhale. So um, that's a little nerve-wracking for people because it requires a different way for you to breathe than you normally breathe every day. Breathe every Usually day. we breathe without thinking, right. too. So to, to S focus on your breathing like this, incredibly difficult. And you have to monitor everything. And Patty, which is the, the dive uh, group, has come up with ways to communicate because your mouth is busy breathing. And, you know, so you have to, like, stop or wait right there. Come toward me. How are you? I'm okay. Or I'm okay. And uh, the other thing is, you know, do you have a problem with your air? So if you have a problem with your air, that. So for scientific research, they developed these full face masks where the air was coming into the mask and it was one chamber instead of two. Instead of your eyes being separated from your mouth, it's all encased in one clear plastic chamber and the rubber seals are to the side and all the way around your head. Now the problem with this apparatus is it has multiple straps, so it's harder to fit someone, especially a small head. Mm. Um, so you really have to make sure that you're not getting water because it's really difficult to clear that mask if water starts to infiltrate the mask. But the great thing about it and why scientists loved it so much is that it is one clear vision from every side of your face. There's no panic about I can't see on either side of my head. So you can see everything around you and you can talk just like you would normally talk, and you can breathe just like you normally breathe. So that's come into uh, being a lot more popular for recreational divers, and now they have that mask. That's the mask that Matt Gutman showed us that they were using on these boys today. And um, so that's the mask they're going to be in. It will take a lot of the panic out, and I'll tell you from everyone learning, and I learned late in life, so even as a 40-something-year-old guy learning to dive, the first time you throw someone in the water, it's a panic because your mouth is closed, you can't breathe, you can't see, you're underwater, and you just want to rip everything off and head toward the surface. So you have to learn, the difficult thing about training someone to dive is learning to overcome that, learning to trust that the air is flowing, learning that you have people around you that you can signal to for help if you need help, and that everything will happen. They're telling us they have multiple air supplies for each person as they go through. So, they, so they've set up different stations right. where if somebody so, has a problem. Exactly. Yeah. If you have something wrong, there's another way to get air to you. If you can't breathe for some way, here's the way that we'll do it. And it's very easy now with equipment to detach your air supply without having to take that piece out of your mouth and put a new piece in and re-rig a tank. You can actually detach it from a place that's very close to your side 
just make that connection and you have a fresh tank of air. And incredible too. And we know that those Navy SEALs have actually been training with the boys for a few days, establishing that relationship and that trust that you pointed out that's so crucial. Sam, we're going to come back to you in just a moment, but I want to bring back our Eva Pilgrim who's live with us in London. Uh, Eva, you've been following all the latest developments. I know that there was a press conference underway. Uh, are we learning anything new about what's happening on the ground there in Thailand? Well, you were talking about those divers. I think it's interesting to note the fact that we don't have an infinite supply of these expert divers to help get these boys out of the cave. And these guys have been working nonstop around the clock for days now, trying to clear the way to lay the path to help get these boys out. In the press conference, they announced that there are actually 90 divers going into this cave, 50 foreign divers, 40 of those Thai Navy SEALs that are running this operation together. That number seems like a lot of divers when you think about the fact that there are only 12 boys and then this coach in there, but all the extra work that they're having to do to make sure that these boys are safe, 90 really isn't that many people. And then two divers with each pair of boys that comes out. You see now kind of why this has been such a slow but steady process in trying to get these boys out. The latest we heard, and you heard Adrian talking about it, four of the boys are out. They are healthy, and it's going to be 10 to 20 more hours before they're able to, to go back in and get to the rest of those boys. It is interesting as well to know of the 12, the ages of these young men that are in there. They're between 11 and 16 years old. So some of these boys are quite young. And if you can just imagine what it would be like to be an 11 year old boy trapped in a cave now for weeks, uh, quite a scary situation. And thinking about the, all the parents as well who've been in agony waiting outside the cave entrance of praying, hoping for good news and already getting some amazing Beautiful news this morning uh, and into the evening there in Thailand. Uh, Eva Pilgrim, uh, stay with us, too. I do want to go back to John Cohen, former acting undersecretary with the Department of Homeland Security, who's been helping us understand this operation. And, uh, and John, Eva pointed out that up to 90 divers in this cave. This is about a, a three-mile stretch of cave here. How do all those divers from different countries coordinate such an operation? Well, that, that's a huge challenge. I suspect that uh, you have some divers that uh, will are being prepositioned along the route along with equipment, and they may be breaking up the, the, the trek from where the children are located currently uh, to the mouth of the cave. So you may have a group of divers uh, that help with one segment of the trip uh, and then uh, another group that uh, takes over uh, for, for a different segment of the trip. You know, communication down that cave is going to be difficult. Um, you know, some radio systems may work down there, others may not. Um, and so a lot of the communication is going to be visual communication uh, or, or when the divers come into contact with each other, uh, con you, know, um, um, you know, providing updates to the divers who are helping or the, the rescuers who are helping with the next segment. And John, and maybe you can answer this, maybe not. We've been trying to get more information, but we were getting word that they were removing the weakest boys first. Um, they didn't, officials in Thailand didn't elaborate on their conditions or why they were t determined to be the weakest. But can you give us some insight on you know, why those decisions would be made to remove those boys first? What types of things would be considered to make sure that they get out of the cave as fast as possible? Yeah, for two reasons. One, um this isn't going to be a rescue operation that is accomplished in a, in a short time frame. So you're going to want to move the, the victims um, out who, need the, who most urgently need some type of medical assistance or even uh, maybe uh, not handling the psychological elements of being uh, trapped down in that cave for this long period of time. Uh, and if this is going to take several days to complete, uh, you're going to want your strongest most stable um, uh, individuals uh, to be the last ones you move out. All right, John, thank you so much. Again, for all of our viewers there, stay with us. This is continuing breaking news coverage of that Thailand cave rescue. I'm Whit Johnson in New York. We are going to bring you continuous developments throughout the day. As soon as we get new information, we will break back in. You can follow all of our ABC News coverage on abcnews.com, the ABC News app, and of course on ABC on television 
in your area. Again, four boys confirmed rescued, removed from that cave in Thailand. The operation is underway. A number of divers underground will have more throughout the day.